Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This week's episode is brought to you by Cats. Recently, news broke of a Spanish woman who was fined 100 euros for carrying a handbag saying all cats are beautiful because police thought the initials ACAB meant all cats are bastards. So to help remind police that it's okay to love cats, we're offering 50% off our ACAB shirts, patches, and bandanas at the Witchside Media Collective store. Just use promo code ACAB at checkout. And remember, all cats are beautiful. You're actually wearing your All Cats Are Beautiful shirt right now. I am. Yeah. yeah. Looks pretty nice. Thanks. Yeah. Witchsidecollective.org. This is episode 187. Yeah, we talk with Manu and Graham from the South Pacific Christian Anarchist Network. I think this is a really interesting conversation. Um, we, we really get into, you know, what the, the, the relations between Christian and anarchism, what brought them towards both uh, co- colonialism, um, Maori land rights, just a whole bunch of really interesting topics. I really, really enjoyed it. We even got into a current American politics for a little bit. Yeah, from a secular standpoint, like, I learned a lot, I have to say. Yeah, no, I think I did too. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. So uh, stick around for that one. It's a lot of fun. Hey, Jordan, what news and events do we have going on this week? Well, if you're going to be in Utah on June 10th, you can go check out the intergenerational family campout that's put on by Utah Tar Sands Resistance at PR Springs. If you're anywhere else... On June 11th, it's the International Day of Solidarity with Eco and Anarchist Prisoners. So be sure to write your prisoners and throw an event. If you're not throwing one, find one. Um, And then also, if you're going to be in D.C. on June 11th, it's uh, Convergence Against Toxic Prisons. So check that out. June 11th through June 13th. This week's listener shout out is brought to you by The Usual Chong. Kia ora koutou e hoa mā, ko John tōku ingoa, no Ngāti Parau ahau. I just want to shout out all those people that are striving towards language revitalization and keeping the, the language and cultural practices of their peoples alive, especially in the face of this neo-colonial shitstorm, I guess. Ha <laughs> ha! Um, kia ora to Jeremy and Jordan for all the awesome work that they do, and kia ora to you all for listening. Che che! I think that shout out's pretty relevant. If you'd like to shout something out, you can record your own shout out, just like John did, or we can shout something out for you. We'll be your shills. All you have to do is go to whichsidepodcast.com, click on that little shout out advertisement thingamabob, and we'll shout something out for you. You also get sweet swag with your shout out. That's sweet, sweet swag. In the form of a bandana or a patch. For the thing show. For the. God damn it. <laughs> For the slingshot this week, June 8th, 1904, Colorado militia kills six strikers in Dunville. 79 people were deported to Kansas. That was a couple years before Ludlow. Ludlow, I believe, was 1911. I can't remember. I can't remember. I get confused. But man, those those workers, man, they, they fought and, and died. And... Yeah, people really need to know about their history of, like, the, the workers, workers struggle, right? yeah, yeah. Like they killed women, children, men, um, burned them in tents alive. Like it's horrible, horribly horrible stuff. fucked up. They hired these like PI firms to come in and mm-hmm. just kill people. They would also hire the National Guard at the time. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's just horrible, horrible shit. And it was legal. Take these little tidbits of history. Pull them out of the slingshot personal organizer. Go get one yourself at a local info shop or an online info shop like AK Press. I sincerely hope you enjoy this episode.
So, no gods, no masters. What's that all about? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> we were just discussing that, actually, over uh, making sure we were on message. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, I was just rereading our stuff from the original, um, I guess, of South Pacific Christian Anarchists, and our kind of foundation uh, passage was really First Samuel eight. So I think, um, um, and I think that's pretty foundational to the idea of Christian anarchism for us in New Zealand, anyway. So, w- what did, what's your history uh, with? Uh, Christianity, like, uh, is it something you were raised into, or is that something you, you came to later on in life? Um, for me, Manu, in, um, in my early years, I was taken along to Sunday school at a Methodist church. My parents, um, my father had been a Baptist, but he been quite involved in the Baptist youth movement in New Zealand um, in his 20s. And um, but sort of fell out with him after he kept asking too many questions. Um, but my mum stayed in the Methodists, and um, so that was my sort of early years. And I remember getting to about thirteen and saying, "I don't believe in God anymore." I think she was a bit sad about that. But um, and then when I was about sixteen, I started um, hanging out with a group, and they invited me along to a Youth for Christ camp and um, had a, a spiritual epiphany or some sort, and. Um, and converted uh, and it was quite a Pentecostal sort of uh, charismatic Christianity um, at that point and that carried on for me for a few years into my early 20s um, and I sort of got to a point where I was like is this all there is to, to Christianity going to church and being a good person and sort of praying a lot and reading your bible and trying to convert other people it seemed like yeah it sort of run its course for me in some ways and then um yeah, I just sort of felt a, a bit of a calling to put the faith into action a bit more and started hanging out with some youth workers. And um, they were also Youth for Christ Connected, but uh, which is a, a movement from the States, but it had been brought to New Zealand in the 50s, quite a fundamentalist sort of um, version of Christianity, yeah. evangelical. And um, But they had quite a social gospel to their sort of um, theology and so were involved in... Um, some political action and um, activism, particularly at the time it was around East Timor, um, but also other issues in terms of homelessness and uh, inner city issues in in Wellington, which is our capital city where I was living at the time. So got involved with them and that sort of was my second wave or maybe third if you count my Sunday school years. Um, Sort of very social sort of gospel Christianity and um, described that as, a, as my second conversion um, and started hanging out with Catholic workers. That was also a movement that started in the States and came to New Zealand in the early 90s, which was sort of around that time. A woman called Moana Cole, who uh, was a Kiwi New Zealander, but she um, got involved with the Catholic workers and uh, went to New York uh, at the start of the first Gulf War, 91, and um, with three other Catholic workers, they broke into the Air Force, uh, Griffith Air Force Base and um, sabotaged the B-52 bomber and um, and dug up, started digging up the, the runway and things and went to jail for a year um, during for that action. And, um, and she, so she had come back to New Zealand. She'd just come out of prison in the States and got deported back to New Zealand. So, um, yeah, she was in our circle of friends and, and quite influential and, was blowing my mind with the Catholic worker theology. And and one thing that stood out for me was her suggestion that Jesus was a good person, but not a good citizen in the sense that uh, he did a lot of good things uh, for the, uh, those who were marginalized, those who were being oppressed and missing out in the system that he, in the community and the society he lived in. Um, And a lot of that meant that he was going against the status quo and the, the powers that be um yeah so i started reading uh, jacques Lul and he was another um christian anarchist and tolstoy and those sort of ones and that was my early 20s and yeah it's kind of carried on from there hmm. so so it seems like the yeah for my 
Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. Uh, I was just going to say for myself, uh, we, I attended a Catholic college, didn't have any Christian upbringing. Uh, uh, one of the 5% non-Catholics at our at our college and was quite experienced with uh, the Eucharist and Mass and uh, oh. religious education. Anyway, after, after varsity, um, towards the time that my now wife and I were progressing towards marriage, uh, we had a, I guess, a conversion experience and ended up attending an Assembly of God church in Wellington, the capital city. Um, and we're lucky enough, really, or blessed enough, that uh, uh, in doing that we encountered Justin and Jenny Duckworth. Justin's now the bishop of the for the Anglican Church in the Wellington Diocese, uh, who was also part of the community that Manu's referring to in Wellington, Urban Vision. Uh, and um, we felt... We felt called to put the gospel into action, so we got involved with Urban Vision, and that kind of that social gospel was uh, um, right alongside our our conversion experience. So, in many ways, we had what's turned out to be a um, a strange experience of Christianity. We've always been involved with uh, alongside the poor, um, responding to injustices, and talking about a social. Uh, and moderately anarchist gospel. Yeah. Well, what I find really interesting about, about both your stories is um, I, I was personally raised in a, in a, in a fundamentalist uh, Mormon faith, so very... Um, as was I. So very, very religious. <laughs> but as I became more radical, um, I didn't find that the, the radical politics didn't jive with the religion more as that the people that were in the religion didn't jive with the radical politics, if that makes sense. And that's what made me really step away. Um, do, do you, do you both feel that you, you see that a lot where, where people don't um, grasp the, the radicalism of what a lot of uh, religions preach? Yeah. Uh, look, um, Graham here. I think um, what. Uh, I think that's absolutely true. I guess the, for my wife and I, what fascinated us was as we immersed ourselves in the social gospel and intentional Christian community, living alongside uh, uh, the street people of Wellington, um, people who, who had in the church uh, were, um, uh, were leery and often vaguely offended, I think they saw it as a judgment on the gospel that they themselves held. Whereas interestingly, our friends uh, who we formed at Varsity, majority of whom are not Christians, have no Christian background, um, felt were very supportive of our lives in those communities. On the basis, one of them said to us, well, if you're going to follow Jesus, then it makes sense that you go and do something. Uh, so our strongest supporters were always those who weren't involved in the church in terms of the lifestyles we were living. Yeah, I guess my experience has been, and I've always been lucky to find that community of like-minded people who um, are on a similar journey. Um, and while at the moment, like for the last well, nearly 20 years, haven't necessarily lived in the same place, been able to remain, contact, um, remain in contact with some of them, and um, that certainly makes it easier and um and those that are in the the church that we've r sort of got alongside um have struggled with the, the radicalism of our interpretation of the scriptures and in traditions and in opportunities i suppose to to follow that that path um and some of them have been really interested and um keen to to go on a similar journey themselves and others yeah find that too hard the the momentum of the institution is so great for many i think it's um yeah all consuming and um and their priorities are in other places so we just find those fellow travelers and journey with them for a while and yeah others may come across our path and, and at the moment in the context that we're, we're living in a rural community um with only a few hundred people and <laughs> there's um what we've got there, I suppose, is um, yeah, very few people who would have had a similar journey to ourselves, if any. Um, 
but everyone's got their own story and so it's always about trying to find those uh, things that we have in common uh, rather than focus on the differences which I think too often religion and, and faith communities tend to need to to build walls around themselves to maintain and grow their own identity and rather than sort of reaching out and finding those areas of commonality. Mm. I think the, the, the larger anarchist uh, community in general does a, um, a bad job of doing that like as well of cultivating our own communities. And I think we build our own walls pretty, pretty high and mm. we have a, a high barrier to kind of get into um, and, and really be accepted in, into the communities, unfortunately. And on top of that, like, like you expect people to like know their anarchist like history and have read all of the anarchist literature and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And that's just not going to be the case with everyone in the community. Yeah, 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 absolutely. There, um, it has been interesting over the years when we when we established an actual Christian anarchist, I guess, gathering um, to engage with with the an- wider anarchist community. And there's certainly there's a strong theme of if you haven't read the anarchist writers, if you're not committed to um, or you're not demonstrating the style that those Christian, that those anarchist communities demonstrate. There's a bit of suspicion around the Christian anarchist community in that regards. What, what, what yeah. I find, oh, sorry. I was reflecting, you know, at our gatherings, we tend to have um, a number of people who are identify more as Christians and much less as anarchists, and they're interested and curious, and likewise would have a number of probably people who describe themselves as atheists or secular uh, anarchists come along who are also curious and uh, yeah, keen to, to pursue that. And I think there was a period at one point a few years back where the Christian anarchists were sort of the most organised um, and coherent of any of the <laughs> anarchist communities, <laughs> yeah. um, which annoyed some of the, the other mainstream anarchists. Um, but I think, yeah. do, you, do you think that has to do with the idea of Christianity already bringing its group together? So it's it's easy to organize around that one aspect already, and there's already uh, a pretty solid feeling of community around that. I think yeah, Christians have a tradition, I suppose, of ritual and and getting together and and doing stuff together. Where perhaps for other other um, strains of the anarchist tradition, um, people haven't necessarily had so much um, you know the sol- solidarity that they might experience around a particular issue or something. Often. Is temporal. It's sort of you know it's there while the issue is hot, and then that community disperses and waits for the next issue to come along or something. Whereas I guess Christians have, for centuries, for better or worse, um, got together and done stuff, regardless of what else is going on around them, and and had in some senses community for its own sake. Um, and maybe that's that's one difference. I don't really thought about that too much. Yeah. The other the other difference I, in my own reflections, is there is a uh, there is a real sense in which Christianity encourages self-reflection and self-insight. Uh, so, so the examination of oneself. Uh, so, in pulling together a group of people, you have people at a variety of stages on that journey, but nevertheless, this expectation that uh, you will deal with your uh, own issues, which is entirely not the case uh, in other. This is in other communities, including other anarchist communities. That sense of self insight, a lot of insight and self reflection, uh-huh. is not an expectation, whereas it is in Christian communities. You know, one of the things that I, I find myself um, trying to explain to people is so I, I am not a person of faith anymore. I, I'm an, an atheist now, but um, I'm an atheist that it, it sounds weird, but I wish I believed, if that, if that kind of makes sense. And it's because of the aspect of community. So, in, in the faith that I was raised up in, we uh, not just met on Sundays, but we met also two to three times a week on top of that. So we we were meeting as a community in different organizations for up to eight to ten hours a week. And mm. that's what I, I really miss that. And I, and I, and I wish um, we could find a way to organize ourselves in, in, in a similar manner. Maybe not and, so yeah. much, but. And, and that is a very, very socialist religion in, in a sense. Um they they have a lot of um, they got their shit together I guess they could say <laughs> but uh, but yeah they like with with food storage and um, providing for people who are unable to their assistance programs their assistance stuff. programs and everything yeah. else it's very 
very well put together. Um, mm. But I feel like most of the people don't actually follow that like socialist tendency in their daily life outside of the church either. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So how do you, how do you feel that as anarchists we could better emulate those types? of gatherings is it just that it with like uh religious gatherings or christianity in particular it's more ritual based uh, and and the larger anarchist scenes seem to uh push against all forms of ritual Hmm. yeah i think those you know to, to have a community that's got some continuity you do need some stuff that you do the same on a regular basis that that sense of tradition or kind of this is what we do when we get together Mm -hmm. provide that's what community is and that's you know it's sort of a mutually reinforcing cycle of of doing that stuff which strengthens a community which you know and some of that can be really unhealthy over time and and you need renewal and and things to be refreshed from time to time but um that's in in a sense the definition of community isn't it that there's these kind of common um, practices and in ways of the language and that kind of stuff um, that brings people together so that you you have that that bonding um, and at the same time you need the bridging kind of community where it's not an exclusive thing but is is continually outreaching and I guess um, our uh, Christian experience has been quite evangelical and so that's kind of had that outreach it's been an outward focused um, faith and and open and encouraging of others to participate um, and maybe if we'd come from a different strain of Christianity it, you know may, may have not be so much of our experience um, but those you know even if it's sharing meals and sharing songs and um, and you know I think that there is a degree of that in, in many anarchist communities I went to a anarchist cafe in Portland a few years ago and it was clearly the sort of the, the church of the local anarchists in terms of the music and <laughs> libations and um and had a real sense of community there and and so i think those things are uh are happening and, and are possible but they take it does also take some people to be the you know we might call them can carriers or the vision holders their purpose is to build a community not to necessarily lead the march or um be organizing the next issue stuff but their focus is on that pastoral care of building a coherent community that works it out its differences and how to get along with each other. And, um, and you need some people that are in that space um, rather than just the frontline troops. Yeah, ritual ritual is absolutely central to uh, the development of community. It's, it's, and it's certainly not something that Christians have a, an exclusive uh, license to. I'm also... Uh, Māori, which is an indigenous New Zealander, and ritual is central to how our community comes together at our in our community centres. Uh, and so, in many ways, it doesn't matter what the ritual is, as long as the ritual reflects the values of the community you're trying to form uh, and affirms people's roles in upholding those values. So um, you were talking a little bit about um, Catholic workers, and I, I was familiar with the the case where they had gone in and destroyed that B-52 and uh, tore up the runway. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with a lot of other things. I know that here in the United States, um, there's the no more deaths, if you're not familiar with that. And there are some, a lot of Christian folks are helping um, get supplies across the border to make sure that people aren't dying when they're trying to come over into the United States from the Mexican border border angels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, a lot of anarchists are working with them, but they're not anarchist Christians. They're just, uh, anarchists who happen to be working with secular anarchists who happen to be working with, um, non anarchist Christians. Mm. Um, yeah, I, w- I was just yeah. going to ask about um, other other things like that that um, that you might be familiar with, but um, go ahead. Yeah, the the Catholic Worker Movement, um, Dorothy Day and Peter Morin. Peter was a, a French um, theologian, poet, monk, um, and uh, Dorothy was a um, a communist a journalist. Um, in the first part of the 20th century and had a 
conversion experience. And um, but they founded this movement, which has really existed on the fringes of the institutional church, mostly Catholic um, church, uh, since I'm a Catholic worker. But there is some Protestant Catholic worker chapters apparently. Um, and as I understand it, they sort of had three um, main tenets. One was um, works of mercy, and so it was during the Depression that it was founded, and so there was a lot of soup kitchens and uh, providing uh, homes to the homeless and, and that kind of stuff. And that's carried on, and, and I guess that's expressed in things like um, the border. So, you know, they might be involved in that sort of stuff, or um, Central America was big in the 80s and sort of um, – in helping refugees and in that sort of thing. Um, and then the second was um, resistance to the military industrial complex for probably had a different name for it, but it was that sort of active opposition to, um, to war and to, to uh, organized violence by the state. Um, and the third is uh, agrarian reform and, and um, Catholic worker farms, which is the rural sort of um, subsistence lifestyle, um, providing alternatives to the, the urban um, experience and urbanisation. Um, and those have been the three things, I think, that have carried them forward. So there's Catholic worker farms still around the world, um, as well as homes of hospitality, and certainly Catholic workers involved in a lot of um, social justice and anti-war activities um, on a regular basis and then yeah beyond that there's heaps of other stuff that they do but those were sort of the three things that that they were founded on and have continued um you you both talked a little bit about your, your origins with with christianity but what brought you both to uh the radical politics of, of anarchism it's mm-hmm. a good question uh for me i um uh my original degree was in sociology um, and uh, also around the period I started uh, university here in New Zealand, um, I started to explore my identity as an Indigenous New Zealander, uh, and the combination of those two things uh, led me to be critical of the status quo in our society and to explore uh, uh, radical politics. I uh, started with... Uh, the Bolsheviks here in, in which is there was a group of them in Christchurch and in Wellington, um, and then over time started to explore some of the um, uh, anarchist uh, expressions. Um, I don't think at any stage I would say I was form I had formally attached myself to the idea of being an anarchist until uh, really I had read and and. Uh, cons- Really, until I got involved in to in the um, uh, social justice tradition in the church, and it was that that led me into uh, reading Jacques Ellul and exploring the anarchist writers in more depth. Um, yeah, yeah, for me, likewise, I guess, um, as I was saying, in my early twenties, I started reading some of those Christian anarchist writers, I was at university, and um, and it just seemed to make sense, sort of a combination with the faith tradition that I'd come from, and feeling like there was something more to it, um, and uh, yeah, that's just the way that they organised the ideas, um, seemed like, it, yeah, it just had a lot of appeal, um, and I was hanging out with a few anarchists, and um and enjoyed their creativity and um, and the, the seriousness with which they took their commitment to trying to create authentic alternatives to the status quo. And I had, couldn't see anything else on offer, I suppose, um, that was as, as attractive. Um, and having said that, you know, I went on and eventually got elected as a local government representative. Um, and thought that I'd, um, I was a backslidden anarchist and um, <laughs> turned my back on on it. Um, but I have some good friends in the secular anarchists who, who reassured me that I could still be an anarchist and, um, and be an elected official in local government. Um, <laughs> but it's the, the kind of principles of um, not relying on the state to uh, provide care and, and resource 
um, in active opposition to the violence of the state. Um, and from a Christian perspective, I guess the spiritual aspect, and, you know, and, and I guess politics is a bit of a religion for many, um, and so is consumerism, and, and so this alternative to capitalism and, and politics um, seemed like quite a spiritual um, commitment and um, journey as well. So, yeah, they all combined. And a bit of research, like Graham was saying, um, on the history of our country and the traditions of Māori communities that uh, actually seemed to be organised around what I think a um, sort of anarcho-syndicalist uh, society might look like with mutual aid and um, small villages that um, sat around and organised themselves and when they needed to get together with their neighbours, they worked out ways to do that and cooperated and shared resources and had everything in common. So, yeah, there's some some appeal from that sense as well that it actually maybe it's decolonising um, myself and our family and our community to to follow that sort of anarchist tradition as well. Yeah, it's probably worth being clear. So, and specifically for Indigenous New Zealanders, but in terms of probably where, you know, in reflection of what Manu's saying, the anarcho syndicalist um, uh, form of anarchism is, is kind of central. The idea of individual anarchism and, and some of those those ideas appeal less in this setting uh, than uh, the idea of a community form of anarchism. Mm-hmm. And um, Manu, you you live on tribal land, correct? Sorry, on tribal land, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, yep. Did you want to kind of talk about, like, the similarities between Maori and anarchist principles and concepts, practices? Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm not an expert on either, but, um, <laughs> what, you know, so New Zealand was colonized. Um, British arrived in... in in the late 1700s and quickly established settlements. Um, in 1840, a treaty was signed between the indigenous peoples, Māori and, and the British uh, Crown. Um, just before that, a declaration of independence had been uh, proclaimed by the by Māori. Um, and since, in, in the, at the time, there was sort of about 2,000 Europeans in the country and 200,000 Māori. Um, and, but quickly that, that opened the floodgates for European uh, arrivals and uh, that led to a lot of pressure on the land and some land wars in the 1860s through the 1890s uh, where a lot of land was confiscated um, and, um, and taken by force leading to mass uh, dispossession and alienation by the indigenous peoples, a common story around the world um, and uh, through that, there were pockets uh, that remained. So, I can't remember the exact figures, but there's something like 60 million um, hectares of land in New Zealand and only about 6 million were remaining in Māori um, hands by the start of the 20th century. Um, of that, uh, most of it was the worst uh, land in terms of productivity and so on because the Europeans had taken all the best most productive land for themselves and left Māori um, to live in swamps and um, in, in really rugged um, terrain that a uh, few people could survive in. Um, what, what did remain, uh, and some, some Māori had sided with the Crown and so they were able to hold on to a bit more of their land um, because that helped in some of those land wars and so on. So I'm fortunate or unfortunate enough to live in an area where my wife's tribe um, was one of those that had uh, helped the Crown in, in that uh, in those land wars, and so most of the land in our area, um, which is about 100,000 hectares, um, I'm not sure how many acres it is, um, uh, is still in Māori hands, And but what's happened is the, the legislation around it requires that each generation succeeds the last and shares are held in the land, and so rather than reservations or not, completely sure about how that works, Graham talk a bit more, but over there in the, in the States, but over here the the land holdings are owned by individuals or if your family gets organised and forms a trust, then they can, can hold that. So the piece of land that we live on has 300 owners um, 
and only ourselves uh, and one other family live on it. Um, and a farmer farms most of the land and he pays a lease. About $50 each a year um, from that lease. And so my wife's family, which is from there, they, they have um, shares in a number of blocks of land um, that all receive some dividend if there's somebody using it. A lot of the land, because of that succession process, is quite disorganised and um, it doesn't have anyone managing it. So it's um, reverting to indigenous uh, flora, which is uh, quite good for the, the environment. Um, and But it's that communal. So when we wanted to build on that land, we had to go and ask those 300 owners for permission to do so and um, to organise an arrangement with them. Um, of course, 150 of them, nobody knows how to get hold of them um, because they haven't been connected to that piece of land physically for two or three generations, perhaps. Um, so there's all these sort of issues at the administrative side, but in the philosophical side of things, it's a communal ownership of the land. It can't be alienated. You can't sell that land. Uh, it's very, very difficult to sell it um, and so it's going to continue to be communally owned um, in perpetuity forever um, of course the number of owners is going to continue to exponentially grow um, and that will bring with it continued challenges but um, that idea that the land is there for everybody um, and there's a very deep spiritual connection that um, many of those families have to that land so they'd never want to see it go to somebody else and that's some of the big pain I suppose for many of the other tribes that have lost their land as others are living on areas that were sacred and, and um, had fed their family for hundreds of years so yeah it's um, there's some big challenges um, but some great opportunities too in that sense of what we could have done was carve out a piece of that land and go through the court process go to court and have it um, set aside for my wife's family, and so we'd only be dealing with 20 people um, in terms of uh, having a lease on that land, but we quite like the idea of having to seek permission and get the support of um, those 300 owners um, because then we've got some yeah, some greater accountability. It's a communal thing rather than an individual individualised title. Um, yeah, so that's a very, very... <laughs> brief uh, introduction to Māori land issues. Graham can explain yeah. on that. Well, thanks very much. Um, um, I think that, uh, just to clarify the figures, in 1900 it was 11 million, so going from 66 million to 11 million. Today it's 3.4 million uh, um, uh, acres of land in Māori ownership. So uh, demonstrably a really small amount of land throughout the country. And whilst there were tribes that sided with the Crown, the majority of them suffered as well, uh, significant land loss uh, as a result of policies. But um, in reflecting on mm, how on how on the societies that Indigenous, that Māori as Indigenous people had, it's probably important to say that prior to the arrival of the Gospel, whilst our societies were communal, they were also... Um, they weren't necess they weren't run along ethical uh, uh, principles. It was the the meeting of uh, the indigenous philosophies with Christian theology that that's really is saw the rise of ethical ethical communities and in, in, in Māori communities throughout the country, and particularly after the military conflicts in the eighteen sixties, where military resistance. Uh, fundamentally collapsed throughout the country, then uh, you saw the rise of Māori prophets and indigenous um, religious resistance, and those communities were really, really founded along lines that look um, fundamentally um, similar to the idea of what anarchist communities would be founded on. So, uh, for example, Parihaka and Taranaki uh, Maunga Pohatu, which is in um, the Uruwera, which is near where Manu and, and Tash are living in some ways, those communities are running along the ideas of a devolution of authority, of centralised authority to small communities, redistribution of wealth, um, people's labour being um, um, moving back to 
uh, being to supply and meet their needs rather than to be working for others uh, and conscientizing people who lived in those communities. Uh, so, but it was really yeah, the meeting of Christian theology and uh, indigenous need that created this indigenous religious resistance where those communities started to look like, uh, I guess, what I associate with anarcho-syndicalist kind of movements. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, what I find a little, little interesting is that they, um, I think it was Manu who, who said that, that going into anarchism had a lot to do with the decolonizing. Um, and I've always viewed Christianity as a key tenet of the colonization process and, and kind of how Europeans you know, spread across the globe. Um, how, how does that fit into it? Well, I think, um, I think that's absolutely true of the majority Christian uh, expression is it's, uh, it is as tended to uh, walk hand in hand with empire, um, but there's, I mean, it is the idea of of the major- the minority uh, Christian communities, which are ethical and, uh, in a sense, seek to power share and resource share, has been and has has run alongside that majority Christian expression from the very foundation of of the faith. Um, so Manu talked about obviously uh, Catholic workers, but you can go back to the Thirty Years' War and the Hundred Years' War, and to see Anabaptist movements there. There's obviously the Amish, the Amish movements in the United States. There are there are there have been for many many years uh, in every expression of Christianity uh, people who have sought to live Christianity as a powerless expression of faith rather than a, a powerful expression of faith. So you were also talking about how you work with local government. And I just want to want to ask about, you know, anarchist engagement with local government. That's interesting to me. So do you want to talk more about yeah, that a little bit? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I'd, um, Manu here, I've been involved in community organising, um, community development work for a good 10 years in our neighbourhood and in wider um, community in a city of about 35,000 people. Um, and had because I'm not from that city, I'd sort of resisted the idea of ever um, sort of leading too much, but really just wanted to support um but over time, kept getting encouraged by locals to, to step up. And, and a lot of our organising and action was focused on the local government um, in terms of we lived in a poor part of town and um, received um, poor service as a result. Uh, we didn't have any elected representatives that had ever come from our neighbourhood, uh, that sort of stuff. And so eventually uh, people encouraged me and I kind of justified it to myself um, by saying, well, I'm just going there to open a few doors and um, for some others to, to come through. And that's sort of what I did uh, in the end. And, and I guess I also saw some um, potential in local government uh, to outwork some anarchist principles in terms of, in New Zealand, we've only got four million, so four and a half million people in the whole population in the country. Um, we have fairly good um, contact with our um, our capital city and the bureaucracy and all that kind of stuff. It's not hard to um, get hold of our members of parliament and have them come and visit or uh, talk to some senior officials in different government departments. Um, but we still are largely um, controlled from uh, the cent- central um hub of the central government um, in terms of our schools and um, police and all those sort of things are run from the the central government uh, functions. Um, And I guess I saw in local government the opportunity to shift some of that power and some of those responsibilities away from central government to a local level where uh, local community has more say over the decisions that affect it in terms of particularly in terms of the environmental uh, issues uh, environmental protection and that kind of stuff saw a lot of at the time we had oil and gas um, companies uh, being given permits by central government to drill on land and offshore from our area and um, 
that was causing a lot of uh, concern and outrage in the community, but very little we could do. And so I was trying as a local government representative to to um, yeah have greater say at a local level over those sort of decisions. Um, so yeah, I guess it was a sort of get on the inside and see if we can shift things a bit um, to, to a more local level. I was quite interested in participatory um, democracy, participatory budgeting processes, uh, deliberative democracy where communities, you know, like in Switzerland, the, the canton gets together and for a day and thrashes out all the big decisions. Um, I wasn't sold on the idea of um, 15 elected representatives on the council making all the decisions, really trying to push as many things as I could back out to the community. Obviously got a lot of resistance from my colleagues because they uh, quite like having the power and um and their justification is that the, the citizens don't want to be bothered with all that stuff. They, they're they happy for us to get on with it and uh, make those decisions on their behalf. And so, yeah, I was pushing hard the other way. So it was, yeah, it's an interesting um, time and, and opportunity. And, and I, you know, certainly I saw a lot of limitations still in the, the structures and the systems, but um, I think local government does have potential to devolve um, not only power from central government, but also out of itself and into communities uh, a lot more than it does. So, yeah, that was sort of some of my experience. Um, but I also noticed, too, how a little bit of power changed me considerably. All of a sudden, I became the defender of the institution, as well as its critic. But, um, yeah, certainly mm. um, my own sort of ego and all those sort of things start taking over. And when you're sort of put in these positions of responsibility and um you know i guess being outspoken on a number of issues i've got a national platform and um yeah just shifted the way i thought about the world in subtle ways that were kind of um yeah didn't really notice until i stepped back out of it and, and realized that it had corrupted me in in ways that i wasn't happy with and not necessarily aware of at the time so yeah it's certainly some of those um misgivings that anarchists have about elected representatives and, and bureaucracies and, and institutional powers, you know, there's a lot of, I found, yeah, that, that there was a lot of truth in, in those. I find, I find that super interesting because I'm only aware of one other anarchist that's in, been involved in uh, in government, and that was in Florida. They were also involved in local government, and they said the exact same thing about they kind of found themselves um, having that power and they didn't really like the way that they started viewing things and reacting. And they also said they had a, a lot of challenges in dealing with the, the community as far as the community wanting to rely on the governmental institutions where the, this person wanted to empower the people to, to do things themselves and not rely on the, the, the state institutions. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, it, our, um, we have a Green Party in New Zealand that's in government. We've got a number of MPs and uh, the leader of the co-leader, there's, there's a male and female co-leader, and the co-leader, the female, um, was one of the leading anarchists in New Zealand um, before she went into office. And um, and she's the greatest sort of defender of the state now. You know, the Green Party are, are quite on the left spectrum anyway, but um, she certainly seems quite big on um, state run stuff mm -hmm. and you know she's probably yeah, still absolutely. got those anarchist principles buried deep down somewhere but in her position she has to push against the um other side of you know the opposition the, the ones that are in power at the moment are uh dealing with the homeless issue and she's saying that we need to build more houses that are owned by the state and, and house these people and and uh, one of her colleagues um i was taking issue with yesterday because some of our marae, which are those indigenous meeting places and communities, have been offering housing to the homeless. So have churches and private individuals have been opening their place because we have this housing crisis in some of our cities. Um, and this colleague of the Green Leader was criticising those marae and those churches and those homes for opening themselves up to house the homeless, saying, no, this is the responsibility of the state. Um, hmm. and it just saddened me that we'd got to that point, I suppose, where those expressions of generosity and care, genuine care, where there wasn't a, a financial remuneration and we weren't um, providing it um, all free for somebody, um, we were being criticised and, and we all looked to the state to, to provide those sort of things. And 
Yeah, I think it's just sad that we, you know, and so the screen leader was also um, saying the same thing, and and so, she, and I don't want to bag her too much. I know what it's like in those positions, but there's a lot of compromise you got to make, and um, and I just struggle to see how an anarchist could, can hold on to their their principles, um, and once you get into those positions where you end up having to toe the party line and and defend the the institution that you're suddenly at the centre of. So, so saying all that, would you advise somebody to to go that route as far as with their local politics if they they feel like that's what they they need to do, or or would you say no, be more community focused and and not so much on the the governmental institutions? Like I've noticed since I've been out of, I have sort of reverted, and I think while I was in there, I was trying to work out was I still an activist or was I a politician, and and I kept forgetting that I was now a politician, and that meant behaving differently um though i was trying to sort of also redefine what what it means to be a politician perhaps but since i've been out i've reverted to more of my activist position and maybe some people like myself are, are naturally you know we should be just on the outside rather than then taking the, the reins on the inside and i think we need people on on, on both sides and particularly those who get the, the anarchist you know the sort of the, the principles um but and, and I would encourage people to give it a go uh, with some provisos around having some good friends that can keep you accountable. Uh, <laughs> some of those things that you, you espouse, which are easy to say when you're not in those positions of responsibility where you don't have legal and, um, and some would say moral ethical obligations um, to to make certain kinds of decisions and, and take certain positions. Uh, they're much easier to, to criticise perhaps than once you're on the inside. Um, but you do need some checks and balances, I think, around you to do that. And had some another Christian anarchist friend come over to one of our events uh, from the States, and he's a kickboxing Christian anarchist pastor who makes um, pipes to smoke. Um, and he would be a good person for you to interview sometime, John <laughs> Jenkins. Um, and he was saying it's for him he would never – put himself up for election because he knows how the power would corrupt him. He's seen it already in himself too much. And I guess you just got to have a huge amount of self-awareness and, um, and not just trust in yourself, but have some people that are going to have your back and, and keep you accountable if you're going to put yourself out there. But it would be great to have more people with anarchist tendencies get in the system and really screw it up. Uh, so, <laughs> so, that you know, we don't, keep looking to that stuff, which is never going to be able to provide the, the stuff that we really need. So, you know, and I just, but I also think you've got to really weigh up. Do you want to give up those years of your life to try and reform a system that's going to be really hard to, to do much about, or do you keep putting your energy that's limited and um, what you have got to offer into stuff that are, are creating authentic alternatives to that system that we think is fundamentally broken and is beyond repair. But, you know, that's just my where I'm at today. <laughs> so, so with all that out there, um, what are both your takes on um, anarchists saying that anarchists shouldn't vote? Mm. <laughs> we had a big argument about this at our last election, I think. <laughs> yes, we did. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was the first general election that I hadn't voted in, and um, and I got quite a bit of flack from from people. And I think part of that was I was just jaded coming out of the political system had also been quite involved in a national um, election campaign and um, yeah, and got just it sort of kicked myself for my involvement in that and so I was very even more cynical than usual about national <laughs> politics and um, so yeah I was, I was really anti and sort of putting it out there and um, um, so yeah I'm still like nah don't vote yeah, I, uh, my view <laughs> my view today my view today uh, is that in local body, so local government politics in New Zealand, there's still there's still the potential to make real difference with with uh, 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 with people going into there who have a similar moral and ethical basis for what they're doing. With all the provisos that Manu's just outlined, so voting in local body does make some sense to me. Voting in the national elections less so. Uh, and Manu quite eloquently, you know, outlined the problems with the party that I think he and I would both naturally tend to support the Greens in terms of how they've uh, 
are they transformed by the system rather than transforming of the system? In saying that, both of us are really interested observers of international politics, and then there's some there are some elections where not voting is more damaging than not. And for me, the coming election in the United States, where you're going to have fundamentally crazy psychopath running versus against another. versus another versus another well it's basically who's who? one is one is on the pathway to the kind of fascist expressions that arose throughout Europe uh, at the beginning of the 20th century one isn't one is going to be more of the same the other one is the start of a dialogue that really none of us want to be having in our society. So in those instances, you've got to wrestle with whether voting's the lesser of two evils in that regards. That one's really tough for me. It's Just- really tough for me as well. <clears throat> I'm, I'm a huge like a huge proponent, like you are, as far as like voting locally and, mm-hmm. and things that can really make a difference. Um, but, I mean, the, the, the amount of authoritarian talk coming out of Trump is... is fucking scary uh, very scary <laughs> and, and yeah and, and like i had this argument with my parents the other day where uh so much so that i know if he was arrested i'm okay saying this out there i'll do everything i can to stop any of the policies he did so far as going to put myself in danger like i'm i'm okay with that i mm-hmm. i think we need to fight you know that type of authoritarianism that hard um I, I don't necessarily see myself having to do that with the other major candidate but i don't necessarily think the other major candidate will lead us to a, a better path, if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. I don't think either Manu or I would think it's going to lead you to a better path. But the <laughs> other one, but the other one, uh, the, you know, Trump is, is, is... Trump has started a conversation not just in the United States, but here in New Zealand, where is it, or, it is all right to debate authoritarianism again. Mm-hmm. And that just cannot be allowed. That is... That is such a fundamental regression on what has been achieved for what it is in the past, you know, 100, 150 years. On the other side of things, <laughs> <laughs> you could argue that it would be great if Trump was elected and the whole system imploded. Um, there would be a huge amount of suffering, of course, um, but perhaps it would be a temporary arrangement uh, um, before we can start rebuilding something within the shell of the old i mean i don't I, know yeah i mean i i, Otherwise, I, I, I just think that, I, I i just fundamentally disagree um i i can't i can't say i i'm gonna allow that type of suffering uh for the hopes of a better do you know what i mean i i, I understand that it might create that better but i wouldn't want to push it because we don't no. know what the outcome would be no yeah. people people are too important to play that game, in my opinion. Yep. Yeah. And I'm already seeing a lot of like anti-establishment politics coming out of like the younger generation here. Like, um, you know, one of the other candidates that's running who is unlikely to get the seat is, you know, is pushing that anti-establishment rhetoric, even though they, you know, they've they're a politician through and through. Are you talking but, about Bernie? Yeah. I mean, he's clearly yeah. establishment. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, absolutely. But um, but you're seeing like people are realizing that the system isn't in their favor. It is rigged in a lot of ways, and and so I, I think a lot of people are realizing that on both sides. On um, um more than just rigged, I think what's really interesting about seeing uh, this election, as far as the youth are concerned here in America, and maybe you 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 both can let us know if this is what you're seeing there as well, is that. Um, I think it's the first time that people are getting really politically engaged at a, a younger age here. And I think it's the first time they're realizing that the idea that we're a democracy is bullshit, that they've been sold this idea. And now they're fundamentally realizing that it's actually not true. We don't live in a direct, direct democracy. And it's far from mm. that. Mm. That's think. encouraging. I don't think we've got that over here yet. No, I think um, see, we have a fundamental dispossession of large segments of our population our population and so they're disassociated with the political process that's fine but what's concerning of course is they're disassociating themselves from civics as well mm-hmm. so from community and and uh, any political involvement uh, and that's that's a killer for a functional society 
Hmm. Well, I just wish that we could get a green candidate on any level of government here, because <laughs> <laughs> how amazing would it be to have Jill Stein as a president? I mean, mm. from an anarchist yeah. perspective. <laughs> yeah. I mean, still mm. problems, but better, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, so to get a, a little, <laughs> little more with, with what you guys are working on, what what projects do you do you hold uh, true and dear, and what do you do you find yourself working on more in your own communities, being a Christian anarchist? Mm. Um, I've got a little project that just sprung up in the last fortnight. We had a um, a mayor of a, a city um, who, when he went into office, was quite rednecking. Like he he calls himself a recovering racist now because he he was completely ignorant of the history of his community and uh, particularly indigenous um, perspectives and experience in the place that he was then elected mayor of. Um, and through his time there, did started researching the history of not only their place but the country as a whole and it opened his eyes to the the, the way that the whole system has been uh, orchestrated for the last 200 years and um and and, and i guess seeing his himself now then and as a key part in that system um and it's a very um it's where the land wars um were most vicious and started um his place and there's a huge legacy there of of alienation of land and and um in dispossessed uh, communities who are still hurt obviously um and still remember all of that and uh, and then a whole you know the the uh, white population which is in complete denial of any of that um and that's why they elected him um and so he had this epiphany he came around and and started um championing and did Indigenous peoples to have a seat on on, on the council, um, and just one, um, and all of a sudden he got this massive backlash with um, people from the public turning up um, in Nazi uniforms, spitting on him at the supermarket in front of his kids, uh, quoting scripture from the Bible about why it was wrong, what he was doing, all this sort of stuff. You know, he came out with that in the national media two weeks ago, and um, and that was, and then the the guy who was hosting the TV show totally slammed him afterwards and that created a massive um, outpouring of um, frustration, I suppose, around the country. And I just set up a little Facebook group to send him some messages of support because I knew what it was like being in that sort of position. And um, all of a sudden it grew to over 10,000 members um, within sort of three days. And this massive debate about these issues in our countries are sort of the foundation um issues that are still unresolved for, for most of the country. Um, and a lot of um, European settler descendants uh, wrestling with their identity and trying to work out that, you know, there was a lot of um, hunger, I suppose, to, to um, start getting into that stuff more. And um, and then still a lot of angry uh, Māori Indigenous voices coming through and, and all that sort of stuff. But so it's a project that I've sort of... Um, <clears throat> been having to admin for the last two weeks and a couple of days ago i put it on hold turned all the comments off and um in an end it's but it sparked a lot of opportunities and so there's quite a few projects i think that's gonna come out of that for the country um which is interesting and timely and um and really cool um and then on a day-to-day sort of basis so yeah we're just um in a rural community uh, with high unemployment and trying to create some some jobs um, using the the native plants that are around us. Um, looking at uh, working with some scientists and trying to see if there's some good stuff in those that we can turn into products for um, horticulture and animal and human health. Um, with people wanting to get away from some of the nasty stuff. Um, so I've got a little enterprise development projects on the go there. They, those are things taking up most of my time on top of family. Yeah, and, and similarly on top of family, my um my key and I guess my key involvement at the moment is in our tribal authority uh, in New Zealand. A lot of tribes are going through a process of settling their historical grievances from the landlords with the government, and uh, our tribe is 
just recently going through that process with the potential for a significant amount of money to be uh, to arrive on our doorstep in the next sort of 18 months. Uh, so I'm a, a, a representative on our tribal board. Uh, and so in that space, um, we have some decisions to make around governance and around how we use that resource. The tendency in New Zealand has been to establish essentially many corporates for tribes. Uh, and so I'm one of those, and thankfully not the only one, but one of the voices in our tribe talking about other ways of using that resource to encourage our local our local um, uh, tribal communities to uh, have locally generated economic development, to look after their own social and health needs. Um, and in the midst of that as well is how we relate to the government. Uh, there's still this tendency to want to depend on the government being the central provider of health and social welfare to our people. Uh, but we have one tribe in the country, Tuhoi, that's put a vision out there about uh, effectively taking that back as their own responsibility. So we're having those conversations as well. So uh, that's why I've been on that now for five years <laughs> and, and um, uh, still a minority voice, but that's what we're doing at the moment. Well, how can people get in touch and find out more information? And get involved, <laughs> right? I was, I was just saying to, to Graham, well, we need a website for the South Pacific Christian Anarchists. We used to have a little corner of the there's a JesusRadicals.com is a the big, um, and I think they avoid the Christian Anarchist label, but they are pretty much um, based in the States. They're very and, Mennonite, um, right? Yeah, yeah, they yeah, are. Yeah, they are. So we, we, we organized our first gathering 10 years ago this year and um, over here, and I remember sending the information off to them and they thought we were like a hoax um, <laughs> and refused to have anything to do with us. Um, likewise, we sent it to the National Christian Newspaper and they um, refused to, to promote the event. Um, <laughs> they thought, thought they said, aren't anarchists um, ones that walk around in, um, in boots and throw bombs? And I said, no, those are fascists, I think. But, um, <laughs> and so, yeah, we're sort of yeah, got a yeah. Put a, we've got a Facebook, a South Pacific Christian Anarchist Facebook, Facebook, and that that name was uh, yeah. Over here, we've got the Society for the Protection of Cruelty to Animals, which is SPCA, and so we've got the same acronym. So there's a bit of confusion there sometimes, um, <laughs> but we have quite a few members from Australia. For a few years, we had alternating events between Australia and New Zealand, and then we all felt too guilty about the carbon mile. Um, we don't do the Australia and New Zealand get together, but we have some from the Philippines and other parts of the Pacific in, in that group um, and try to organise something in, in New Zealand uh, every year to get together. Yep. So find us on Facebook. That just made me, made me ask, like, uh, you, you have a hard time being anarchist with Christians, but do you have a hard time um, being Christian with anarchists? Oh, actually, no, the anarchists have attended. Yeah, the sorry, money. I said anarchists have attended our events. Have always been uh, really gracious, really gracious uh, to yeah. Christian ritual in those settings. <laughs> yeah, they they love it. The ones that have come along, um, being very supportive and encouraging. Um, I was just thinking, though, I did come across one thread on a um, on an anarchist. Um, forum somewhere in New Zealand that said, oh, you know, I've been to one of their things and they're not real anarchists. So. <laughs> <laughs> We've got yeah. the same thing before. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure every anarchist probably has. <laughs> we're, we're too vegan for anarchists and too anarchists for vegans. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this week you heard Dope Crunk by Beats Antique. Right now you're listening to Fresh Snow by Moonlit Sailor. iTunes. You know, every week we're going to ask you to go rate review us on iTunes. It just helps out the show in tremendous ways. It just makes it easier for people to find it. And if you don't want to rate and review us, quite honestly, the better thing to do is just tell a friend. Tell a friend to listen to the show. Show them how they can, you know, access it on their phones. Because pretty much, you know, all, I would say all smartphones pretty much 
could, could access the show. So rate, review us, or tell your friend about us. It'd uh, be much appreciated. And while you're telling your friends, you should become our friend on social media. Um, you can shout out things to us, and we'll talk back. Brandon Mullins recently wrote, These are the most comfortable shirts fucking ever. Hashtag no gods, no masters, just laundry. In reference to some of the Witch Side Media Collective shirts. They are pretty fucking sweet shirts, by the way. They are very comfortable. Yes, they are. So, say hi to us. We'll post things on social media pretty much every day that we don't talk about on the podcast. Because, you know, we only do this once a week. We do social media every day. Because that's the world we live in. All social and shit. Socialism. (laughs) Socialism media. Socialist media. God damn it, I shouldn't laugh at that. It's not even funny. It's not. (laughs) Socialist media. It's kind of funny. (laughs) Fuck shit down. Which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective. With web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes. Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn.